thank you to Scottish Hazards for inviting me to come along. And can I also, before I go into the, the topic that I've been asked to discuss specifically around the, the devolution of health and safety, just also acknowledge the, the really, really difficult 18 months uh, that we've been through. Uh, many of the biggest challenges faced by people uh, have been faced in the workplace uh, in relation to this pandemic. And I wanted to take my hat off and, and really pay tribute to the work of our health and safety reps because uh, you've really been on the front line fighting for, you know, PPE, making sure proper safety guidance is put in place, uh, the speed at which you've had to do that and the pressure at which people have felt under, um, you know, quite rightly from our members, etc., has been immense. And I just want you to know that we are absolutely, you know, aware that that has been going on and, and the tremendous work uh, that, that has taken place day in, day out, uh, to support workers uh, through this pandemic. Um, and I'm, I'm glad to be invited to talk about the, the specific issue uh, that I've been asked to, to address as part of the panel discussion today. Um, and that's around the, the devolution uh, of health and safety law to the Scottish Parliament. It's something that, as people will be aware, that the STUC has for some time now uh, supported. And uh, we also support what we would describe more widely as the whole suite of powers uh, associated with employment protection being devolved to that Scottish Parliament level. And that actually pay, played a very key part in the STUC's submission uh, to the Smith Commission following the last Indy referendum. And when we're talking about the whole suite, you know, what we're saying is that as well as health and safety law, we would like to see minimum wage legislation, employment law, equalities law, and legislation covering trade union rights all devolved to a Scottish Parliament level. And I think that you can't really talk about the health and safety in isolation without talking about the rest of that suite of powers because they're interlinked and intertwined with each other. And, and also to some extent intertwined increasingly with powers that are already being held and exercised at a Scottish parliamentary level. And it is really important that they come as a package because as we all know, as trade unionists, you can have the best individual rights around on you know, health and safety, equalities, or any kind of employment rights, but your ability and, and the feeling of empowerment to access and enforce these legal rights can, in many cases, in practical terms, be effectively taken forward without the collective power offered by strong trade unions. So having that trade union uh, legislation also devolved is really, really important to be able to empower people to enact a lot of the individual rights that they have. And if we're looking at a uh, devolution of these sorts of uh, rights, if we look at models across the globe, there really is no sort of one size fits all when it comes to the devolution of these powers. We know that in different comparable states, a, a really wide variety of different approaches are taken. Um, if you look at Europe, for example, employment protection tends not to be devolved uh, as a competency within states. Uh, however, if you look at North America uh, and, and you know, Canada, the, the opposite is really true, where you know, different states will have a quite, quite high level of devolved uh, legislation around that suite of employment protections. So contrary to what some might want us to believe, there is no international consensus that suggests devolution of employment protections is a bad idea. In fact, the principle of subsidiarity would dictate that legislative competencies should sit at the most local possible level, while of course maintaining coherence and being able to be effectively delivered by whatever administration is in, in charge of them. And there's really kind of two arguments that are generally put forward by those who would 
kind of look to oppose uh, these kind of moves for, for devolution of health and safety. The first one uh, that we hear a lot is that moving away from UK-wide legislation would impact on, on business, it would impact the common market approach, uh, it would create inefficiencies and potentially affect jobs uh, and, and businesses' choices to, to trade within our, our shores. And I think that given this argument is one that suggests jobs might be put at risk, it's one that as trade unionists we, we, we have to take seriously and we have to think through. However, I think a number of key points should be borne in mind when we're, we're looking at this uh, argument. The first uh, key point I would make is that by far Scotland's largest number of employers are actually Scotland-only based SMEs. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, most of our larger companies, uh, whether that be brewers or energy producers or banking institutions or steel manufacturers, where these are actually global operations uh, and they're used to operating a, across a whole number of different countries where employment protections differ. So I don't really think that that's a, a viable argument that they're, they're putting to us on that. The other answer that I would give to that argument is that the companies that do currently operate across different parts of the UK are already doing so within a framework where laws and regulations that affect their practice already differ quite widely. And there's multiple examples of this. Uh, we only have to look to Northern Ireland uh, as an example of where there's been devolution around these areas. And also, despite the recent passing of the Internal Market Act, uh, procurement legislation and guidance differs in Scotland uh, than it does across the rest of the UK. We have a completely different system of civil justice here in Scotland, um, which through the different treatment of workplace injury has an impact on practice of employers. Uh, we have a whole devolved public sector uh, here in Scotland that in most cases sets wages at different rates uh, and conditions uh, differently. And that has an indirect impact on private sector pay within the Scottish economy. Uh, our asbestos legislation is different. Uh, our environmental law is devolved. And the Scottish government also has a devolved investment policy that allows it to attach conditionality and expectations on employers, irrespective of what happens in other parts of these islands. So for me, it's precisely for these reasons around the differences in approach that already exist, that the case for devolution of areas like health and safety is so strong. And the other case put against us and historically, uh, I'm, I'm sad to say that this includes positions uh, put by both our sister organisation, the TUC, and certainly until recently uh, by the Scottish Labour Party, is that devolution uh, of employment laws could provoke some sort of race to the bottom. Now, it's often put forward, particularly in relation to the minimum wage, but it is potentially transferable to other areas of workplace protection. And the argument goes that by moving away from UK-wide provision, UK government would be left in a more empowered position to alter protections within nations and even between regions. And the fear here is that governments would seek to lower protections, particularly wage protections, dependent on relative levels of wealth or cost of living across those, those different regions. And it is something that, of course, is always open to government to choose to do that. Uh, there'd be nothing to stop them doing that now if they chose to. Uh, but I think the assertion that they'd be any more likely to do so just because Scotland held these powers at a devolved level is, is a lot harder to justify particularly as we already have a body of evidence from Northern Ireland where devolved powers around employment are greater, that irrespective of differentiation between Northern Irish and UK approaches, the existence of separate devolved powers hasn't provoked any serious moves to remove protections in parts of England eh, 
or, or indeed lessen them uh, in, in the area where they're devolved. So in our submissions to the Smith Commission, we actually analysed the impact of the different devolved settlement in Northern Ireland on key areas of workplace protection. And what we found was that despite the differences, the majority of workplace protections in Northern Ireland still mirrored those of the rest of the UK, and that where divergence had been achieved, it was actually to the advantage of workers in that region. So when it comes to whether we'd be likely to see some sort of race to the bottom in Scotland as a result of such changes, I think we can say with some confidence that there's very little evidence to suggest the prospect of Scotland seeing a weakening of employment protection relative to the rest of the UK through devolution of these sort of areas. And I think there is also a lot that we could gain from this. We know through many years of research and experience that there's a Scottish health and safety and indeed a public health anomaly in Scotland. There are differences industrially between Scotland and the rest of the UK. These differences are related to the pattern of industry, to our geography, and also to deep-seated social factors. And it seems hard then to argue that a Scottish centred approach backed by legislation in Scotland, and yes, with a properly resourced Scottish health and safety executive, couldn't better address the particular issues that we face in Scottish workplaces. Moreover, we already have a range of evidence that through our lobbying and campaigning, we've consistently been able to achieve stronger support in the Scottish Parliament for health and safety protections even if for constitutional reasons the ability of the parliament to legislate has been cur curtailed. So, for example, the Scottish Government remains pledged to repealing Section 69 of the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act, if it had the power to do so. And despite some differences on what can currently be achieved, successive political administrations at Holyrood have accepted the logic of strengthening corporate killing legislation. And we've also been ahead of the curve in Scotland on asbestos and plural plaque, thanks to the campaigning zeal of asbestos support organisations. So I certainly have faith in our ability to campaign and lobby further and win vital protection for workers here in Scotland if we can win the power of the Scottish Parliament to legislate on these issues. And whilst there's no immediate evidence that UK government will cede this power at any time soon, we all know that we live in a Scotland where our constitutional future is far from settled. And there could be significant opportunities ahead for further devolution of key laws in the context of a potential further Indirev 2. So I think we have to remain alert and be ready to reach for such gains when the time comes. And of course, we're now living through the pandemic. And this has resulted in a scene, a, a, a sort of blurring of the hard lines that separated reserved workplace health and safety from the devolved powers uh, that, that have been held in Scotland. And while the STUC hasn't always agreed with the Scottish government on its public and workplace health positions over the past 18 months, I think we've frequently successfully influenced them towards a more safety-oriented approach than there has been seen in Westminster. And throughout the pandemic, public health advice and regulation, which has devolved, has also effectively been workplace health advice and has, in certain cases, been included in workplace regulation and guidance. So during this period, the Scottish Government has extended its reach into the workplace like never before. And finally, we should look to the potential offered by the fact that health and safety in the workplace is also a key tenant of the Fair Work Agenda. Now, the Scottish Government claims it wants to become a Fair Work World Leader by 2025. Uh, we have a First Minister who talks the talk of the wellbeing economy where measures around health and welfare of the population are seen as important economic indicators alongside growth. And in terms of leverage, 
while the Scottish Government may be lacking in employment law powers to enforce the, these agendas, we're increasingly building up the arguments that the Scottish Government must look to its funding, its licensing and its purchasing power to achieve these aims. Because there's at least a £13 billion procurement and funding budget in the mix, uh, so when it comes to fair work, the STUC is pressing hard for conditionality explicitly linked to clear fair work benchmarks to be placed on all public funding, commissioning, procurement and licensing, and clear commitments from employers around health and safety should form part of that package. These are things that government could be doing right now, so perhaps by increasing the focus that we place on that, and achieving better outcomes in the short term, that too can help us further make the case that with greater powers over health and safety at work and the whole suite of employment protections and trade union rights, greater things can be achieved for Scotland's workers in the future. Thank you.